Hello everyone and welcome back to computer vision lecture series. In this lecture we are going to talk about corner detection. We will start from feature uh, points and then we move on to see how corner is a, a very good example of a feature point. So let's go ahead. Um, we are going to talk about different, we are going to discuss different properties of um, uh, good interest points and Harris detect Harris corner uh, corners. Uh, we will also look into the mathematical mathematical formulation of how uh, Harris corner works, and we are also going to look into invariances and covariance of uh, Harris corners. It's important because um, once you know these uh, features of Harris corners, you would know or uh, you will be in a better position to apply Harris corner detection in uh, a given application. Um, so we started with filtering and we moved on to edges and corners are natural flow to our uh, low to high level uh, computer vision tasks right so corners are more distinctive features than edges because edges uh, tend to change in one direction they tend to remain constant in one direction whereas corner have more uh, lesser degrees of freedom and therefore they bring out um, a, a distinctive property uh, uh, or they have a distinctive characteristic that they are more unique uh, as compared to edges. So feature points are also called, um, corner is one of the feature points, uh, it's also called uh, interest key po interest points, key points, uh, basically we, these are all considered as lo local features. Um, so what are the main components of local features? Um, they should be, uh, we should find a distinctive um, set of uh, key points. Uh, the first step is in detection of these features. Uh, then how to describe them in a in a vector form in a compact vector form so once you de de uh, detect the features you need to know how to represent them into a either a matrix or a vector form in your machine or in the algorithm uh, this is one example given here and then at the end you match those features across images to find uh, different correspondences uh, what could be the applications of this feature point detection so when you uh, think about it in image alignment for example uh, a panorama stretching is uh, a direct application of feature points because um, in panorama the successive images are changing slightly and you want to match uh, a lot of a uh, um, lot of features which are uh, which are common in this uh, slightly changing uh, images and you want to align them and that's where feature uh, descriptors or feature uh, points come into play um, in panorama, you also need uh, some blending techniques uh, because there is ch uh, some changing uh, brightness. So you know your um, feature points uh, should be robust to noise, uh, specifically um, uh, photometric uh, transformations like uh, illumination in this case of panorama. To be robust, uh, your feature point det detector should be robust to this thing so that you are able to stitch well. 3D reconstruction obviously. Um, you need multiple views of the same image and you need um, so feature points is a direct application of 3D reconstruction in motion tracking for example robots when they are navigating in the real world the camera is uh, moving along with the ro robot and it's mapping the scene continuously and in, in order to navigate you need to track uh, or keep uh, uh, attention towards the specific objects in your neighborhood and in order to keep track in successive frames because you are using a video camera um, you need to detect these feature points to be able to reconstruct um, a 3d uh, virtual world and therefore it becomes easier to navigate uh, same goes for uh, indexing and database retrieval for example in google image search you want a particular let's say you want to look for a red flower or something like that and redness is uh, a feature that you are looking for and when you put in in the search uh, it becomes um, uh, a property of uh, image retrieval um, uh, another example is uh, object detect uh, object recognition where you can have uh, a vector or matrix um, with a collection of uh, gradients or a histogram of gradients and then you use these features um, to recognize objects across uh, different images. And this is an example for feature point uh, matching across different views. Uh, basically you find uh, 
that these two stop signs are uh, similar in some sense that they are uh, both red in color with uh, stop written in white and when you want to match or you want to find an equivalent um, feature uh, representing this uh, circular patch um, you are able to find it here uh, although it's a bit rotated and uh, a bit more resolved um, however uh, feature point um, detection helps in um, finding similar features across different uh, or similar looking images as well um, uh, a basic template matching of uh, this feature will not give a good result because uh, you need robust feature alignment across uh, across different views so as we discussed uh, earlier doing uh, when we, we were talking about um, correlation uh, that uh, one of one of the application of correlation is image uh, matching or template matching uh, here correlation um, will not be so useful because it's not so robust across different views Another example is um, estimating uh, for the fundamental matrix between two views. Fundamental matrix is basically a three cross three matrix which represents a transformation between two uh, stereo image pairs. Uh, stereo image pairs are, uh, as you already know, and if you don't, are images which are separated slightly uh, or taken from a slightly different angle, whereas keeping, keeping the same uh, camera centered the same and because of this you are able to generate a shifted version of the image and uh, if you if you, uh, so feature point detection will help you uh, uh, you know estimate the fundamental matrix through which you will be able to find out the transformation applied to generate uh, one view from the other and if you are able to find this transformation basically you will be able to match each and every point in the image um, in, in the pair of images basically Another example is a structure of motion, which we discussed already in the introduction to computer vision. Um, this is a, a work uh, called uh, Building Rome in a Day. I highly recommend you to go to their website and check out different um, uh, uh, different um, recreations of or uh, you know reconstruction of uh, different uh, landmarks in uh, in Rome that they have um, uh, created there. It's it's a very good interesting video where. You go. Th uh, they take you in a 3D world of point clouds, and these point clouds are basically each point is basically uh, basically represent these different distinct uh, key points that they were able to recon um, um, recover from all these different um, pool of images. Um, all these images do not have any camera calibration properties uh, associated with them. So, this reconstruction of um, this Coliseum is purely based on um, feature point matching and this is a very good um, example of structure from uh, different uh, different um, images here okay here we we see that uh, there are two different images um, which has the same object and uh, feature point matching can be achieved if we are able to fi find um, these key point key point descriptors such that they are invariant and repeat, uh, repeat, uh, invariant to local features uh, sorry invariant to geometric transformation so we need to find such features which are uh, uh, distinctive and repeatable so basically invariant to image transformation this image is uh, not really transformed these are two different images however um, when we say invariant uh, to image transformation what we mean is um, that uh, brightness and illumination variations should not affect the feature point uh, it should be so distinct that it should be robust to these uh, changes in uh, illumination and brightness and similarly uh, it applies with uh, geometric variation that if you have a translation right in the uh, or, or a rotation or a scaling the feature points uh, uh, you are still able to recover or generate uh, those distinctive feature points Panorama stitching, as we discussed before, there are certain um, um, when you calculate feature, when you find different uh, key points here uh, in both these images, you will be able to combine both these images into one by matching those key points or the features um, feature points across these two uh, images. So, when you think about it, uh, what can be 
characteristics of uh, good features. Uh, you want such features which are robust, which are invariant to different scaling and transformations and so on and so forth. So here basically we have uh, summarized in terms of um, um, different characteristics, right? So one, the first characteristic that you're looking for is it's repeatable. So in across these two images, you find such uh, um, features that can, you can find in both of them. Um, irrespective of uh, uh, geometric or photometric transformation so that you are able to match them across images. Also, uh, saliency is very important for features because each feature has to be very different. Uh, so what do we mean by salient? Salient is something very distinct, very different, very unique to that particular feature. So we want to find such features which are unique uh, so that because we don't know where we will be matching these features. So if they are unique, all of these um, feature points, if they are unique, then it's easy to match them across uh, different views. Uh, compactness and efficiency is required in terms of features because always we are going to talk about um, uh, computations and storage of these features in our machines and therefore it, make, it makes more sense to have compact and more efficient features. So fewer the f number of uh, features um, than number of uh, image pixels is uh, a very mm, simplistic uh, uh, example. Another example, uh, another uh, characteristic is a uh, locality. Um, what we mean by this is a feature occupies a relatively small area. It should not be big, too big, or it should not be too small, because uh, if it is too big, then it's difficult to find um, salient or repeatable features. And if it is too small, then it is it it becomes very naive. Like uh, for example, if you take one pixel value from the sky image. It will be naive because you can match it across a lot of image uh, pixel values here. So, you need to be in this um, a feature should occupy uh, occupy such a size that it is um, uh, robust to clutter, uh, robust to uh, occlusions, ro robust to transformations, uh, and such things. So, our goal is to find. Um, um, interest point or feature point which are repeatable. We want to detect at least some of them across uh, images. In this example, as we see these uh, on the left image, we found four dif distinct feature points. On the right also, uh, we found four, but they are not really uh, repeated uh, here. And therefore, this feature uh, point uh, extraction is not useful for us. And there is no um, easy way to find matches and and therefore, we need um, repeatable uh, feature points. Same thing. Um, same thing with the uh, descriptor distinct distinctiveness. So the feature descriptors should be very distinct. Uh, what we mean is like, uh, for example, here there is a one feature, and if it is not distinct enough, then it can map to multiple places in the uh, multiple points in the another image. We, and we don't want that. We want to reliably determine this feature across images and therefore we want it to be very distinct and unique. Um, it should also provide, as, um, as discussed before, invariance to some geometric and photometric differences. So if there are illumination differences or in this case, uh, the, it's a scale, the right image is a scaled version of the left image, then um, uh, our feature uh, descriptor should be robust enough to be able to be uh, localized in both images so that we can match them easily. So basically, um, local features have uh, three main components. Uh, basically, first you go ahead and detect them. Uh, you describe them. You find a way of representing those descriptors. And uh, it could be in the form of a vector or in the form of a matrix. It doesn't matter. And then you match across different, uh, ma match these features which you represented in a vector or a matrix form across different uh, image views or different images. So what's the, the basic idea of detection is uh, we don't know that a particular feature descriptor, uh, where will, will it be located in the next image, right? There is no way we, we, we are able, uh, we, we can know this in advanced. Um, another important point is um, how, uh, we, we need to compute uh, a stability or uh, robustness for a particular feature um, in such a way that it is 
invariant or uh, it is uh, stable to small variations in its uh, locality so if you move a window uh, so if you move an um, a window or, or your focus region around that feature point uh, in x and y direction in your image and uh, it is still able to be uh, it is and it is distinct as compared to its local neighborhood then you can say that the feature is very um, stable right uh, basically in a loser terms when you have an image patch when you compare the image patch along its neighbors and if it does not match then it's a more unique uh, feature uh, for example here if you have um, a feature on the top at the peak here and if you move along uh, different directions you will not find similar features um, easily right so this image is uh, this feature would be considered a very good local and has a good stability whereas a feature in the sky region will if you move around in its neighbor it, it will find a lot of matches in the image itself and therefore it's not considered to be a very good stable uh, feature um, so when you think of it and when you think about this um, stability issue or the stability property corner come, come out to be a very normal or uh, normal uh, cons consequent to this idea because let's say you have an edge and if you move along the edge then you are uh, you're easily able to find the same features along the edge right uh, whereas in in case of corners the movement uh, is restricted and it's not easy to find um, same uh, similar features al along the corners and therefore corner becomes a very good feature point uh, and it's important um, that we recognize these characteristics of the features uh, before we go for detection. So yeah, corner detection is the um, natural flow to our discussion. So the question comes, uh, how do we recognize such corners, right? Um, so what are the probable or uh, the pro possible characteristics that we are looking for in this in these corners? So we. Um, Let's say we have a, a window like this, and if we move around in different direction, uh, there is no change in intensity or uh, um, feature values uh, if we move around, right? So this is basically a flat, re a flat region, and there is uh, it does not give us much information. So this is not a good uh, feature point here. Um, let's say so. Before um, before I, um, we go ahead, uh, I want to clarify: a window is just. Um, a small it could be any window we are just um, what we mean by window here is we are uh, currently focusing in this region of the image okay uh, to find the features uh, in case of edges so let's say if your our window is here and if we move along this edge um, there is no change um, uh, along this edge right whereas in case of uh, I'm sorry. Whereas in case of uh, a corner, if you go along in different directions, uh, there is a significant change in illumination or in geometry, geometry, and so on and so forth. And therefore, um, corners comes out to be a very good uh, feature uh, descriptor. Um, how do you, uh, as we were discussing here, how do you um, uh, recognize such corners, right? So. Uh, this was one way of uh, finding that you move around your window along uh, different directions and you see that in case of corners um, uh, there is a significant change and then you can say um, it's a corner but it's it's a very rough uh, estimation or uh, approximation uh, this is just an example but in a real world images it would be very very difficult to do this uh, for every image so we we go back to autocorrelation autocorrelation is uh, basically correlation with uh, itself and what we want to do is we find we want to find autocorrelation of the image along with its uh, shifted value uh, shifted intensity so uh, you compute the difference uh, the squared difference of this image and its uh, shifted intensity value along a window function a window, window function could be a simple square or uh, a gaussian it doesn't really matter uh, it's just a way of uh, focusing in a particular uh, neighborhood. Mm, so this is how. Um, so this is our image, and this is a window of um, uh, for the image with, uh, and this is your um, autocorrelation uh, intensity uh, map here. Uh, this is the local um, 
0 comma 0 and uh, this is a shifted version of um, so this value is com computed from by, by shifting the window uh, in this direction uh, 3 pixels on the in the x direction and 2 pixels in the y direction and you uh, you generate this pixel value of the autocorrelation um, function uh, let's uh, see an example here from the natural images um, here we see that there are uh, three autocorrelation surfaces here 1 2 and 3 shown both uh, as grayscale images as well as uh, surface plots um, this image uh, the o o so the original image is marked with three red crosses to denote where the autocorrelation is uh, happening uh, this patch is taken from um, from the flower here and so this patch is generated by uh, doing autocorrelation um, uh, around, uh, along, around this uh, patch here on the right uh, as you can see we get one uh, peak value so when you move around the uh, when you move the window around uh, in different directions you are not able to find uh, a very good correlation and therefore there is just one peak here uh, the second point or the second patch is taken from the roof edge it's uh, and when we look at the uh, autocorrelation uh, pro uh, profile uh, it's basically in the surface plot it's like a ridge or um, a valley a continuous valley and this re uh, this represents that along this direction it's uh, it's getting a lot of peaks so it represents an edge whereas in case of um, uh, the third patch which is uh, from the cloud there is no good peak so no matter where in which direction you move you find a good autocorrelation and therefore there are a lot of peaks uh, visible in this uh, autocorrelation uh, surface um, so we want to see how e we want to discover how e behaves from uh, smaller shifts right but this is very slow to compute as you would have imagined let's say it's, it has a very high computational complexity if you have a window of width uh, 112 with a shift range of 112 with image width of uh, around 6000 you will have 5.2 billion uh, of this um, um, uh, billion of these uh, computations uh, and that is just for one image and almost uh, 14.6 thousand per pixel in your image it's it's these are rough estimates but these are too high for um, finding um, key points in a single image um, so we want to reduce this so what do we do here so we want to imagine how e behaves for smaller shifts right so but we already know in a way uh, the kind of response that uh, we expect in e we are looking for a strong peak in the center right so whenever we move around in the local neighbor neighborhood um, we should not get more peaks around there so basically this will ensure that uh, the feature that we have selected is unique so we want uh, a profile uh, like this so can we so the naturally the question comes that uh, from now onwards we are going to do a lot of approximations and a lot of assumptions to achieve what we want uh, by looking at this profile we could imagine that um, if we can approximate this um, peak value in, in this form then we have um, already uh, com uh, computed uh, the autocorrelation um, uh, property of a particular neighborhood like what it should look like basically and uh, can we approximate by it by a quadratic surface yes we can um, so the question is why the question is that the, the reason is that we already know the profile of a good uh, feature descriptor looks like this uh, in 2d is like this surface plot is like this and we want to approximate it and we go ahead and take a quadratic surface to as an approximate of this surely uh, after this there have been a lot of research done where you uh, approximate um, the uh, autocorrelation with uh, maybe um, uh, cubic or uh, te uh, tetra uh, level of uh, complexity complex surfaces however in that case the computations increase you will we will see that uh, in the next uh, slides so we want to represent any a, a function autocorrelation function as a quadratic function so what are the tools available with us if you remember uh, a taylor series um, 
um, which is represented in this frame uh, at a single point A is can be represented like this. So any function f of x can be represented in the uh, Taylor series form, where f dash is a derivative of that function at the point A, and f double dash is a second order derivative, and so on and so forth. Um, as we care about a window which is centered at um, zero point, um, if you convert this a equals a to zeros, uh, we basically get a Maclaurin series. And uh, on the right is a very good example of uh, uh, an approximation of uh, f of x, uh, which uh, exponential function, which is centered at uh, zero through a Taylor series. So basically, when you increase the number of um, these terms from zero to five, uh, two, three, five, and six. Um, we see how it is able to uh, approximate uh, almost um, very very nicely. It's able to fit like uh, at the n, n, n equals to sixth degree of the complexity uh, up to the sixth derivative. So it goes up to the sixth derivative to approximate very nicely, and so uh, an exponential function can be uh, can be represented in a uh, limited or um, limited time um, limited taylor series up to the sixth um, uh, degree of uh, derivative so when we um, when we uh, think about um, again when we think back again on the um, uh, autocorrelation function um, we are just extrapolating our uh, uh, function into up to only second degree of uh, uh, Taylor series expansion. So this is uh, second order uh, Taylor series expansion uh, with, which has two functions u and v and because we are centering the uh, window in 0 comma 0 or we are using 0 comma 0 uh, across all of this and we are neglecting all the higher order terms here higher order derivatives only up to the second order derivative we are considering. Um, we also get rid of um, this function value because it's uh, set to zero, and we also ignore the first uh, derivative. Um, these are simple approximations that we are making for making our um, analysis um, easier. So we just want to take a look at how uh, the the shape of this second order the second derivative looks like. So let's uh, look at some math here. Um, when you approximate the autocorrelation function with this uh, second order derivative it's nothing but um, uh, uh, it looks like this basically m represents a second moment matrix which can be which is computed of uh, image derivatives directly yeah. so uh, basically if you know m uh, you will be able to approximate uh, the autocorrelation function and the good news is m is a uh, directly computed through image derivatives which we already know or we have already computed so let's see m is represented by the uh, is a two cross two matrix of image derivative um, the derivative in x direction looks like this and y is like this and uh, we already know that partial derivatives are uh, commutative so i of x into y is equivalent to i of y into x and therefore this diagonal entries will be uh, same and you can compute the um, i x squared value um, for uh, the top left and the top bottom co uh, cor uh, corners of the matrix m. Um, so what does this uh, second order matrix uh, really mean here? So uh, when we approximate the autocorrelation function or the surface uh, of uh, in, in of the uh, autocorrelation function by a quadratic form, it basically represents uh, a matrix of uh, image uh, derivatives here. So, um, so this ellipse construct here you see a lot of ellipses here along the a quadratic function here um, basically m represents uh, the equation of a, of an ellipse in this case we are saying that each time c is a constant so if you take a constant value um, it represents uh, one of this uh, contours which has a constant value along when you travel along this uh, contour value and and so each uh, e is a small matrix that contains values for local autocorrelation of an image um, 
uh, it has a set of values from zero to maximum uh, difference between uh, one black or one all white patch which is 255 in, in this case so we can cut e at different uh, values in this set to produce different shapes right um, if you imagine e as a 3d value or a whole shape the shape at c equals to a particular constant value will be a contour here at a particular altitude okay now when we approximate e using the second order um, taylor approximation we are idealizing the shape that e takes right um, so our idealized e is a smooth surface which approximates the this is this is a whole smooth surface which approximates the autocorrelation differences for which the cross sections are ellipses so these ellipses each of these ellipses together they are called um, isolines because um, when you move along these lines they have a constant value and uh, so technically e is constructed of a lot of this kind of different ellipses okay so indirectly e is can be characterized by the um, um, characteristic of an ellipse basically from an equation of an ellipse so here we see that a horizontal slice of e can be represented in this form uh, which is an equation of an ellipse which can be represented in this form so m is a diag uh, it's, it's basically a diagonalization technique where you convert m into its um, r as a is a rotation matrix and L lambda 1 and lambda 2 represent uh, the two axis of the ellipse axis lens and uh, these axis lens are basically the eigenvalues of uh, the matrix m so if you know m you can uh, compute its uh, eigenvalues and that will give you the approximate shape of the autocorrelation matrix however we already know um, uh, the, uh, the the lengths of the ellipses are uh, its eigenvalues and therefore here the shorter length is represented by the maximum lambda value um, raised to the power minus 1 by 2 similarly the uh, longer ellipse um, axis is represented by um, a lower lambda value um, so how do we visualize this right let's uh, let's see an example this is an image uh, grayscale image and this is um, a visualization of these all of these moment matrices that were computed along the uh, whole image here you can see that there are a lot of images a lot of ellipses which are uh, quite well aligned with the edges uh, cor and corners more often than in the plane areas in the plane areas they basically vanish but they are very well um, aligned along the edges and uh, near the corners and you see different shapes of these ellipses right as you can see from here okay so we want to characterize or we want to classify some image points using the eigenvalues of um, this each and every small matrix so let's say if you have sorry uh, each and every small uh, ellipse so if this ellipse if you know the eigenvalues uh, you can characterize this as a plane point or is it an edge or is it a corner and so on and so forth so let's let's take a look so if an ellip, uh, ellipse has um, its eigenvalues large and both are uh, uh, quite big it means that uh, it is a corner because um, e will increase in all direction basically we have a peak uh, basically in the autocorrelation and if the um, uh, autocorrelation function has this um, uh, so if the uh, one of the lambda values is uh, quite higher than the other then it can be characterized as edge whereas if both the lambdas are quite small um, it is uh, basically a flat uh, where e is almost constant more concretely um, we can find the we can define cornerness of a particular um, autocorrelation value of e by using this uh, function so we do a multiplication of the eigenvalues and difference uh, take a difference of it with the uh, squared sum of these eigenvalues um, this can be uh, again approximated using a determinant and the trace of a matrix so 
basically c can be computed by computing the determinant and the trace and determinant is uh, simply the product of all the eigenvalues and trace is the summation of all the eigenvalues right so if c is uh, bigger than 0 then it's a definite corner if it c is very small then it's considered a flat region whereas if c is less than 0 then um, we get different edges so this could be uh, as a horizontal edge whereas this will be uh, a vertical edge um, so what are we achieving here basically by using um, so this is this is uh, the review of um, until now what we discussed for corners was uh, all related to Harris corner detector um, we want to approximate distinctiveness of the features by a local autocorrelation function e right and for that we approximate e to be this quadratic function and uh, in order to find this local quadratic function um, uh, which we saw that we could approximate it using a moment matrix M um, basically instead of even calculating its um, uh, eigenvalues we can just find um, the the cornerness uh, of a given feature point using um, the determinant and trace of the M like we saw here before here so it's it all boils down to just finding M which is nothing but um, a matrix composed of uh, high, uh, second order derivatives of the uh, x direction uh, of the gradient in the x direction and gradient in the y direction and uh, uh, partial derivative of um, not a partial derivative but a derivative of, of uh, in x direction take uh, uh, and a multiplication uh, of it uh, with a derivative in y direction so these are simple um, uh, these gradients are simple to calculate and therefore uh, we can find m and using m using its determinant value and the trace value we can find or we can define whether the region where we computed this m is uh, a corner or not so this brings us to the formal algorithm of the Harris corner detector here um, you have the input image we want to compute m at each pixel value so we go ahead and we compute the ix and iy along um, we can you can fl uh, blur it to remove the um, higher uh, to remove the noises here but um, it's optional so you compute the gradients in x and y direction and then you uh, take uh, squares of it and then um, do a gaussian filtering to smooth it out and then you compute the coordinates of each and every point along the image and yeah basically you threshold c to pick high cornerness you will get a lot of different corners um, and you need to pick a high enough value of c um, to define it as a corner like uh, uh, some of you have already asked this question in the first exercise in the uh, in the forums that when they are taking different thresholds they are able to find different um, uh, feature points and this is where or this is why you are getting different answers it's not a wrong answer it's just different based on your, uh, what threshold you are calculating and then you also apply non maximum suppression to pick peaks so here we have not discussed so because uh, this sixth point comes in because um, uh, in our case in this algorithm you are taking you are computing m at every pixel value so every pixel value will have a cornerness value associated with it and you will find and you will define a region nearby on a neighborhood where you will find a non maximum suppression to find the highest value in that neighborhood and then you will define it as a distinctive feature point or a, a corner in this case uh, so let's go through the Harris uh, detector uh, stepwise using an example here uh, this is an image and it's a shifted or a different viewpoint of the same image um, and this is basically a directly computed directly we computed the corner response of both these images as you can see and then we take a threshold and then you get rid of most of this uh, corners and you focus on the main uh, on the on those uh, points which have high corner responses and then in that you take the non max uh, you do the non maximum suppression along this and you pick up those points which have only the peaks so basically you generate these peaks uh, that you can see in the, on the screen on both the images here and then um, basically you th uh, do the um, 
you know use this peaks value and then uh, you know transform them into the original images to uh, localize each and every uh, feature point here um, these are uh, peculiar um, we would consider them as peculiar feature points because they are not um, uh, present here and these occur because of camera flash in this case and so it's a very typical or uh, very um, very good example of how corner detection should be taken or Harris using when you're using Harris detector um, uh, these are geometric um, features right so you need to be very careful because they are very easily deceived by noise or uh, this kind of artifacts uh, available uh, present in the image and these artifacts can be detected as um, corners also or and eventually feature points so we have to be very careful with this okay so the next question we want to ask ourselves is how invariant are these Harris corners basically right and what do we mean by invariance and um, are locations invariant to photometric transformation and covariant to geometric transformation so before we go ahead and look into that uh, what we mean by invariance is when an image is transformed um, uh, geometrically uh, it's um, the location the corner locations do not change so they remain fixed okay that is what we mean by invariance so if this happens if the image is transformed and if the uh, corner locations do not change then we say that um, whatever detector that you have applied uh, Harris or any other is invariant to this in geometric transformation and what is covariance covariance is basically when you have uh, two transform versions of the same image then the features should be detected in both of the images all of the uh, feature key points should be present in both the image so let's see uh, let's see some typical examples of this um, one is affine intensity change so when you change the um, intensity value of the image and you bump it up by scaling and by shifting so we are we know that in Harris corner detector uh, uh, derivatives image derivatives are used and these derivatives are invariant to intensity shift because um, the difference between the neighboring intensities will be remaining this uh, the constant uh, if you bump up the intensity so uh, we can say that um, Harris corner detector is invariant to uh, intensity shift however intensity for uh, for intensity scaling it is not because let's say this is the threshold that you used for uh, determining the cornerness of every feature key point and these are the um, axis the image coordinate and if you shift and this is the um, uh, intensity uh, axis where you apply this thresholding value and if you, you if you if you do an affine intensity change you scale the value of the image as well right and so basically you are shifting all this uh, intensity range uh, a bit higher and if you still you are using the same threshold you are additionally able to detect extra feature key points and therefore you're not you have more key points in one image than the other one and therefore we uh, um, we, can, we have to say that uh, Harris corners are partially invariant to an affine intensity change for image translation um, basically they are uh, derivatives and, uh, and window function has shift, shift invariant so we can directly say that corner location is covariant with respect to translation uh, same goes with the uh, rotation so if you have if you rotate the image uh, uh, the rotation or uh, the rotational information of this um, autocorrelation um, uh, or the uh, moment matrix generated for that feature key point uh, remains the same except that it has a bit different rotation um, so basically its eigenvalues remain the same uh, also when you think of this eigenvalues are dependent on the image uh, derivatives which again as we saw before are uh, invariant to shifts so they are also invariant to rotations here in this case so corner locations are basically covariant with respect to rotations um, however with scaling it's not they are not covariant to scaling because we saw before as well uh, if you scale the um, image so if you zoom in here uh, your window size remains the constant so if you apply the same windows uh, along this if you after scaling the image you're basically uh, 
uh, your feature point which was a corner before gets converted into or uh, that class they are classified as edges so basically corner locations are not um, uh, in where not covariant to scaling and this brings us um, to the end of our um, fourth lecture uh, second part uh, where we saw so in this uh, two lectures we saw we, we studied edges and corners which are two important uh, feature descriptors um, at the end we were discussing about uh, invariantness of this or uh, covariantness of the feature descriptors right it would be amazing if we are able to get um, such features which are scale invariant right so natural flow to our next lecture would be to discover this kind of features which are scale invariant so uh, specifically they are called scale so there is a transformation that you do which is scale invariant feature transforms and then you generate these features which are um, invariant to shifts and uh, and therefore you are able to find this shifts and scales and so you are able to find these features in uh, different scales in different images which is amazing right uh, we are going to look at uh, them we are going to study about them in the next uh, lecture um, so see you next time thank you